Ready? Okay. Sweet. Hey everyone, I'm Lance. Uh, I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat and an adjunct professor at BU. Uh, welcome to my talk, Super Accessible No Math Intro to Neural Networks for Beginners. I really mean it. There will be no math in this talk beyond addition and subtraction. Uh, and this talk is meant to be very accessible. <laughs> Uh, this talk's meant to be very accessible, so if you don't understand something, it's because I'm not doing a good job explaining it, so please jot down questions. There'll be ample time for Q&A at the end. Most lectures on neural networks start with a deep dive into the biology of a neuron in the brain, and this drives me absolutely nuts. Uh, for one, you know, most data scientists aren't biologists, myself included. And if you ask me, you know, the data science field isn't really lacking in sort of trivia winning encyclopedic mansplainers. What it needs more of is, you know, compassionate and humble engineers willing to accept and acknowledge expertise beyond their own, including biology, for example. Uh, but far worse is how much this misleads people into thinking that neural networks have the potential to function like a human brain, which couldn't be farther from reality. In this talk, I hope to show you that a neural network is just a simple mathematical process in the same way that long division is a simple mathematical process. Or maybe not that simple, but all right, let's get to it. So the whole paradigm of machine learning and data science is capturing and quantifying relationships between things. Some things are related to each other, some things aren't, okay? Um, if I'm trying to understand, for example, the, the biggest predictors of academic success, I might start and say, all right, um, how do I quantify academic success, right? It's a pretty nebulous concept. Um, and I could start off by scoping this and saying, all right, let's define academic success as being defined by GPA, for example. So my next step is to figure out what factors influence a student's GPA. So I might think of things like study time, extracurricular activities, household income, number of absences from class, okay? And we intuitively understand that these are all related to GPA, right? You with me so far? Okay. Data science and machine learning tools help us quantify exactly how much these factors influence GPA. So for example, the output from one of these data science tools would be a mathematical formula like this, right? Absences divided by two plus two times study time minus whatever, right? Equals GPA, okay? So you plug in a student's number of absences, study time, extracurricular, et cetera, and the promise is that you get a number that's relatively close to their GPA. But the accuracy of these machine learning tools completely depends on the quality of these predictors. If I'm using something like the weather at the top of Mount Everest or a person's hair color, right, we intuitively understand that these aren't related at all to GPA. Right? So there cannot exist a mathematical formula that can quantify GPA using only the weather on top of Everest and hair color. Okay, so when we set up a data science task, we would like to collect data that is relevant to that task. So the factors that influence, for example, whether a student will pass or fail an exam are different from the factors that determine whether a tumor is malignant or benign, which are different from the factors that determine whether a credit card transaction is fraudulent or legitimate. Okay. It turns out that Figuring out what factors are best for a given task is the biggest obstacle in machine learning today. Okay, say that again. Finding what factors are important to a task, right? the most important factors for a task, is the biggest obstacle in machine learning today. Okay? The promise of a neural network is not only to quantify the relationship between the predictors and your target, it's a tool to automatically find the best factors for the task, okay? It's a tool that promises to find the best factors for the task, okay? So it's a very sort of appealing um, tool. <laughs> so for example, let's say you're trying to determine whether a student will pass or fail an exam. 
It used to be you had to use things like reasoning or common sense or domain expertise to realize that passing or failing depends on things like the length of the exam, the amount the student studied, their current GPA or well-being, etc. With neural networks, you can pass it all the data you have, relevant or not, and it promises to find the factors that allow it to best predict whether a student will pass an exam. I know what you're thinking. What could go wrong? Well, I'm being facetious, but it's not totally unreasonable of a thought. Information, although not explicitly in the data set, can be still there, hidden under a combination of factors. For example, let's say we don't have GPA in our data set. Maybe we forgot to include it, but it's clearly important to our task of predicting whether or not a student will pass or fail an exam. But if the data has information like study time, hours of extracurricular activities, household income, number of absences, we can probably guess at the GPA of the student because remember, GPA depends on these factors, right? So even though you may not have a given factor explicitly in your data, as with GPA, for example, it's actually very much there, hidden behind a combination of factors like study time, household income, etc. A simpler analogy would be that, you know, I could say, wow, this oven baked egg flour sugar butter mixture looks delicious. Or I could just say, this cake looks delicious. Before neural networks, data scientists had to manually comb through the data to try and extract these hidden factors that could be relevant to their task. Neural networks promise to uncover these hidden factors automatically. Basically, you feed it your data and it just works, or at least that's sort of the idea. And the rise of computational power has made it a highly accessible convenience to simply feed in your data to a neural network for it to magically extract the information it needs for, toward a specific task. But how does this actually work concretely? Okay, What is a neural network? A neural network isn't an app or a product, it's a mathematical process. Let's pretend for a second that an alien new to planet Earth is studying human behavior. They're particularly interested in trying to figure out what exactly determines whether a person can or can't legally drink. Don't ask me, I don't understand alien priorities either. They eventually realize that age seems to be a big factor. So they go around asking people for their age and whether or not they can legally drink. And they get a data set that looks like this, right? So some people can't legally drink, some people can, depending on their age. What they want to figure out is exactly what distinguishes people who can legally drink from those who can't. And there are many ways to go about it, and you can probably think of some off the top of your head right now, right? We could like take the maximum uh, age of the person who can't legally drink and the minimum age of someone who, yeah, and take the halfway point or something like that, right? The whole field of machine learning and data science is full of various tools to do just that. But how do neural networks go about it? Notice that if the alien guesses that what distinguishes people who can legally drink from those who can't is that their age is greater than 50, we'd be making a lot of mistakes. A lot of people 50 and under can legally drink, but they'd predict that they can't. If they guess 40, they're making less mistakes. If they guess 60, they're making more mistakes. So one process they can follow is to make a guess and then adjust the guess in a way that reduces the number of mistakes made. For example, let's say we start with 50. If we look at the mistakes made by guessing that the threshold is 45 or the threshold is 55, we see that 45 is an improvement. Right? Setting the legal drinking age, right? our guess of the legal drinking age to be 45 is an improvement because we're making less mistakes. Now they try 40 and 50, they realize that 40 is an improvement, right? and we can keep going until we get to 20. And we realize, okay, uh, 15 and 25 isn't an improvement, and you know, maybe we can adjust the size of that uh, uh, you know, of the adjustment right? from plus or minus 5 years to plus or minus 1 year. And we could compare 19 and 21 and then realize that 21 is the best place to stop. Okay? 
So this is how neural networks learn by example, repeatedly correcting their guess to better align with the data. And this is what most lectures on neural networks will teach you. But I want to show you a different perspective, one that will sort of uh, make the drawbacks and pitfalls of neural networks maybe more apparent. Okay? Instead of repeatedly changing our guess to better fit the data, what we'd, we'd like to do is repeatedly change the data to better fit our guess. So for example, let's say our guess is that the threshold that distinguishes people who can't legally drink from those who can is zero, the age zero, which obviously doesn't work well, right? There we're making lots of mistakes. But we can shift the data, right? We can shift the data to better align with our guess. So for example, if we subtract five years to everyone's age, all of a sudden we're making less mistakes. And we can keep shifting the data until all people who can legally drink are on the right side of zero and all people who can't are on the left side. Right? We can warp our data toward this guess. And 21 is the number of years by which we need to shift the data in order for things to be properly centered around our guess of zero. And this is a much more accurate representation of what neural networks are actually doing. Usually they have a standardized guess and the goal of the neural network is to figure out how to warp the data toward that guess. We can break up this process into a few key pieces which we can capture in a diagram. This first circle is our raw data, just our age, which then flows into the next circle to be warped and shifted here by 21 years, which is then evaluated by our last circle, which is our guess, is the warped data greater than zero. In order for the green circle to know exactly how to warp the data, we need the red circle to communicate back to the green circle the number of mistakes it made. So we need a feedback loop. Okay, and this, at a high level, is a neural network. Okay, this, at a high level, is a neural network. In practice, you have more than just age, right? We could have, I don't know, study time, exam length, household income, etc. From these, we want our neural network to extract hidden factors, like GPA, for example, which we forgot about, to accomplish our task. So we warp the data in multiple ways hoping that one of these will discover the particular combination of the original factors that equates to GPA. Okay. Let's go through this one step at a time. At first, we have a bunch of data. Some factors may or may not be related to the task. In this case, we could say we're trying to predict whether a student will pass or fail an exam. We feed our data into the neural network to be warped by the various mathematical operations defined by these green circles. And you can just think of we're adding them together, or subtracting them in weird ways, multiplying by them by stuff, you know, whatever. Weird mathematical operations. Okay. And the hope is that we'll uncover some hidden factors which are relevant to the task like GPA. The reality is that well, this might actually work and predict with high accuracy whether a student will pass an exam, untangling the data that has been fed through this network to understand exactly what these hidden factors are is practically impossible. Finally, we use all these hidden factors to make a guess. Through our feedback loop, we can evaluate just how many mistakes are made by the current configuration. Did we shift too much? Did we add things in the wrong way? Did we multiply things too little, etc. We can make these adjustments uh, to sort of how exactly the data is warped um, and, and, and our hope is that we make less mistakes the next time around. We can think of this little guy as a worker with a task and its single task is to warp the data in a unique and fun way. Making adjustments is a bit more complex now because we have to consider how much each worker contributed toward a given mistake. So each worker gets varying levels of adjustment. At each step in this process, we hope to make less and less mistakes. Sometimes though, the path to doing the best job isn't always so straightforward. You can't fix a house into becoming a mansion. At some point, you need to tear it down and build something new, 
right? Temporarily creating sort of a, the worst possible living situation, which would be like the construction site between the two. And this is a big blind spot in neural networks. They always try to reach their goal through constant improvement. But this may not always lead to the best outcome. So while this may intuitively be easy to understand, um, actually finding sort of the best outcome in a reasonable amount of time is so far an unsolved problem. I like the worker analogy because you can think of this neural network as a bunch of individual parts working together toward a common goal. And most of machine learning now is finding different ways to organize these workers so they work together in different ways toward different goals. For example, we could add a lot of layers of workers or, you know, a lot of kind of different relationships between workers. It gets really overwhelming really fast. All right, let's quickly recap before diving into some drawbacks and limitations. So neural networks, they're a mathematical process, okay? We can iteratively, they iteratively guess and then adjust their guess based on the mistakes made. They can warp the original factors in different ways in the hopes of finding hidden factors that are more relevant to the task. Okay. So if someone asks you, what is a neural network? It's a neural network that can learn a task and at the same time uncover the best hidden factors for the task. At least that's the promise of a neural network. Okay. All right, let's dive into some drawbacks and limitations. One of the main drawbacks is that what these workers learn is not clear. Since these are just mathematical transformations of our data, it's not clear what study time plus four times exam length minus household income divided by, you know, what does that mean, right? What does that mean? It's not clear. But beyond interpretability, there's transparency and ethical considerations. In the same way that GPA was hidden in a combination of factors, what kind of racial or ethnic information could be hidden? For example, consider building a hiring tool to evaluate candidates. What combination of factors could equate to racial or ethnic information creating a biased or discriminatory model? And we just don't know until it's too late. Sometimes these neural networks learn hidden factors we don't expect. For example, this neural network was designed to distinguish dogs from wolves, but looking into the neural network, it only looked at the background to make these predictions. It seemed like the most important factor to distinguish wolves from dogs was whether or not there's snow in the background, since most wolves had snow in the background of their picture. And maybe the most important thing to keep in mind is the barrier for entry for using these very powerful predictive tools has been significantly lowered. Uh, it used to be you needed deep statistical knowledge and domain expertise and years of study to understand how certain factors influence a particular outcome. Now we've opened the door to using these tools in ways that are insensible or nonsensical. Here's an example of researchers trying to determine whether a person's face, from a person's face, whether they're a criminal. The neural network has good accuracy, but you have to ask yourself, does a person's face really determine whether they're a criminal? No, right? Can we all agree on this? <laughs> okay. But neural network don't know. Neural network just do. And in this case, by digging deeper, we realized that criminals smiled less in their mugshots compared to ID photos. So what this really is, is a glorified smile detector and not a criminal detection tool. I hope this better help you understand neural networks. Um, I just started a YouTube channel, so if you want to scan this QR code, you can just like, subscribe, and all that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> otherwise, yeah, that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll definitely take some questions now if you have questions. Um, yeah, feel free to ask anything about anything, really. This is supposed to be an accessible talk. If you want to dive deeper into the inner workings, feel free to. Um, so I guess my question is like for how does this work in terms of like language based and like chatbot type of networks? In terms of language based models like LLMs and stuff or how, how does that work? Oh, um, honestly that's a bit outside my domain of expertise. I mean if, if, we, um, if we go back a little bit like usually these models work as trying to predict the next word 
And so there's a relationship between the workers that is trying to keep track of some information while also predicting new information. Um, so uh, maybe it's here on the screen somewhere. Uh, I feel like there's a, it probably looks something like this. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a whole topic in of itself, but um, I guess the best way to think about it is they're trying to predict the next word, but in order for us to predict the next word, we need to save some kind of information that is accumulated through the sentence that has been spoken, I guess. Um, so workers both have to keep track of that memory, but also be able to predict the next word. And that just means a bit of a different configuration. Great question. Yeah. So I was wondering, what is the process that uh, researchers take to like create uh, new forms of neural networks? Um, yeah, I, I personally don't have any experience doing that. <laughs> um, but I would say what, what I have experience with is just like learning and learning these tools sort of, you know, as best as I can. Um, and, you know, as you, as you start using them and you realize, oh, I thought it was supposed to do this. Why is it not doing this automatically? What's going on? Like if you try to use a neural network, most likely it's not even going to work. <laughs> it, it, you might have to tweak and tune a lot of things and it, it's, it's actually harder than it looks. Um, and then you might wonder, well, wh why is that? And what's going on? And what is it about my data that makes things harder to extract information? Um, and then, yeah, I guess like that kind of maybe, you know, uncovers some things you can do with uh, with neural networks that haven't been done before. Um, so I would say if, if you want to get into the research side of things, I'd say try, try using this on data sets that you have some knowledge of um, and uh, where you can kind of expect some outcome in a way and then you, you can kind of reverse engineer things and maybe that'll help um, build the, yeah. Thank you. So given the neural networks are available to, um, to more people, yeah, to many more people every day rather than data scientists and uh, people working in machine learning, um, what do you think are the most important things that people should learn before they, before they use neural networks? Yeah, no, that, that's a great, great question. Um, I don't know that I can come up with a great answer right now, but I would say be honest about what you know and what you don't know. I think too often we get kind of stuck in you know, I mean, in, even in conferences like these, right, like so many talks here, like I don't understand. It's totally outside the area of expertise that I have. But, you know, I do the best that I can to like understand. And but, you know, if I'm really if I really want to understand something like I'm going to try and ans ask so many questions <laughs> and tell people that I just don't understand things until I actually get it. Um, so, like, don't shy away from asking all the questions you need until you actually genuinely get it. Don't pretend like you know something, because I think then it just accumulates. And I, I've, you know, I, I was guilty of doing that all through grad school. Honestly, <laughs> like, you know, I tried to pretend that you know I knew so many things, and then I it caught up to me, and I had to sort of relearn everything, which, in hindsight, was you know beneficial. But I preferred not to have to relearn everything, um, because there were just so many gaps. In so I would say like maybe my biggest thing is just like try to be honest in your learning process with yourself. Like you're not judging yourself. So just uh, yeah, be as honest as you can in learning those tools and be transparent about what you know and don't know. Um, yeah, I could probably come up with a better answer with more time though. Uh, maybe you can chat after. Thank you very much. Cool. Well, thanks so much for joining.